All right, Tom. Uh, I would say welcome to San Diego, but you live here. Um, I know in the MMA hour you said you weren't, didn't know if you were going to stay at the hotel or your own house. So where did you decide on? Um, I, the hotel is gorgeous. Yeah. I'm grateful. Thank you, UFC, for giving us an awesome hotel this time around. So I've been here. And then you've, all, you've long said there were a few things you wanted for your next fight. Fans were an important one. The name, obviously, above you, ranked fighter. So could it have been, gone more perfectly fighting in your backyard against someone ranked above you with fans? Shockingly, no. Plus health, the health on top of it, being healthy. So fans are going to get the best version of me. I'm grateful that I can give that here in this place, too. You've also you've pointed to that that stre that one year stretch where you had three essentially ch well you did three championship fights in less than twelve months three th five round fights since then it's been three round fights outside of the Cejudo preparation that was obviously the pandemic so a little weird so did you have to adjust anything in camp or go back to what you were doing to prepare for these five round fights? Yeah, it's funny you say that. I did. I had to go back to old an old rule book of sprint routines and uh, sparring rounds but the good news is I had those those other rounds to build myself up so the snowball was rolling it was growing I didn't have to have any layoffs in between my sparring sessions so I can't count how many sparring sessions I've had how many live wrestling rounds I've had I no longer uh, have to like come back from a, a deficit so that feels uh, really good on my body and I just feel ready to perform because of it and obviously you've, you do your homework on all your opponents, but now that you are an analyst and a broadcaster, you do really have to pay attention to not just your division, but everyone as a whole. Have you, had, had you called any of Cheeto's past fights like cage side? Yeah, I have. Uh, against my will, like I don't really like calling the, the fights of the guys in my division because obviously they probably get a little annoyed by what I'm saying. And it's, but, um, you know, producer likes to put me there. He likes to get me in those positions where it's like, you know, I think it creates some buzz when I'm there. But I, I've asked to not be there if I can help it sometimes. So going off of that, when did Cheeto get on your radar as a possible opponent for the future? Because it did take him a while to, like, get into this top five. But after his win, his last few wins over Frankie and Rob Fawn, it, it propelled. Well, yeah, I mean, you got to remember... He, I was ranked low too. I wasn't even in the rankings when I started this run again. So um, he wasn't in the rankings, and then he was he was uh, ranked above me at one point, and wasn't even saying my name because he was fighting Jose Aldo's. And then he lost to Jose Aldo, and that put him back down in the rankings while I happened to be winning. So we kind of just passed each other by uh, ranking wise, I guess you would put it from a business standpoint. Um, and then he stayed really busy. And with his action of being busy, uh, he got himself propelled back up in the division, um, and that put him ahead of me because of his activity. I've been kind of taking my time, taking fights at the dates that my body felt good because of, like you said earlier, about the three, three uh, title fights in a year. Not a lot of world champions have done that, and I'm one of them that has. Um, there's a handful of us. And so you feel that. You know, if you go to any – let's say college football uh, season or NFL football season, part of the analytics of who will win the Super Bowl or that end, you know, Rose Bowl or end game has to do with who had the longer season, who had more games, who had harder games, who had more injuries during the season, right? Fighting shouldn't be looked at any different. Uh, so I've kind of, you know, kept my body in the shape it needs to be, stayed healthy, and I feel like I can go out there and perform at my best. and. It works for everybody. It works for the organization to get the best version of me. Uh, being the UFC, it works for the fans. So I'm happy to be here. Now, just looking at his, his past wins and losses, lately he's been getting it done with his striking, but he actually has more submission wins than knockout wins. So just looking at his skill set, what really stands out to you, or is he just a complete well-rounded fighter? Well, the in obvious always stands out to me about people like uh, I try to look for the in obvious That's the stuff that usually makes the difference. So the inobvious thing that I believe makes Vera the most dangerous, ironically enough, are his losses. That's what makes him dangerous. He's felt the other side of things, and now he's felt the winning momentum of things. So I think the people that he's lost to have taught him a lot of lessons, and he's, ad he's adapted well. And having that, I, I attribute it to having a Hispanic background for myself, the toughness, the, the, the tenacity, the not complain and keep working. 
he's got that, and he brings that into his fights. And then just looking at the rest of the division, you, there are a lot of just like main event caliber fights in your division specifically, and even ESPN yesterday had that list of ranking the divisions. They put bantamweight right below lightweight. So this division essentially did start with you and Uriah back when they absorbed WEC. Can you remember a time when there was this much buzz and this, this much hype around the top 15 of your division? Well, mm, that, that was the time that I remember it. When me and him had our rivalry, it really helped set a, a water line for this division. For 145 as well, Aldo, you know, Faber was a big part of that. Um, without his rivalry and that team, Team Alpha Male, and me fighting so many of their teammates, they made me a lot stronger, a lot better. I'm grateful for that rivalry. It taught me a lot. And we're all, you know, the dust has settled with all that. We moved on and stuff. And the, 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 the fight world has continued to move on. And now, you, because I don't think it's just the Bantamweight division, it's also the work of the UFC be, moving to international, being on ESPN and not, uh, you know, started on Spike, went to Versus, went to uh, Fox, now on ESPN. Fuel TV, I think you follow. Fuel TV as well, yeah. So it's like... Um, watching the progression of the TV broadcasts that we're on and then how many, I mean, th how many shows are they having a year right now? It's, in, it's incredible. Plus, yeah. So 50-something shows a year, that puts way more fighters. It gives us way more jobs. It, gives w it creates way more main events. So with all that, I mean, the sports naturally, the level has gone up. With more athletes, more talent can come in. And moving internationally, the way that the UFC has done, uh, it's worldwide sport. It's the fastest growing sport in the world. Well, kind of going off of that, like you mentioned, like Spike TV to Fox to in, in Fuel and out ESPN. Do you think the UFC is big enough to just have their own in-house production and their own streaming service? Or do you think they do need that broadcast partner? I kind of thought they were doing that already, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, you got the Contender, ser the contender Series. That's called Dana White's Contender Series. I'm pretty sure he got tired of these other organizations feeding the UFC so he's like you know what we can feed the UFC you can see it already and the ones on the contender usually get the best push why that's not an accident because they're from in-house uh, same thing with the ultimate fighters started with the ultimate fighter if you won the ultimate fighter championships you generally get a good push marketing wise from the UFC whatever else because that's an in-house promotion that you know why wouldn't you promote the guys that you already dumped the money into you already put the, the TV cameras on them you already have all this storyline for them so Dana White's Contender Series does that, and that began with the Ultimate Fighter, and it's still being used. They're already doing it. Then finally, unrelated to this fight, I was going through your Instagram a few weeks ago. You posted a photo of your face as a kid. You were like attacked by a Rottweiler or something like that. What exactly happened that, to cause that? That's funny that you asked. So that's funny that you saw that. Uh, it's just I was at a race with my mom. She was doing some sort of race, and. I just, I went to give the Rottweiler a kiss on the face because I love dogs and that didn't work out very well. <laughs> and the dog like attacked my face and almost took my eye out. And I took that picture because I had just gotten stitches and I remember specifically being pissed off, like angry in that moment that I let myself get bit in the face by a dog. Like my mom saved me though. She grabbed that dog, the power of a mom, let me tell you. She grabbed that dog, that 150-pound Rottweiler, and chucked it off of me, I was told. I was obviously getting attacked. I don't know, but pretty impressive stuff um, from my mom on that one. Saved me. <laughs> hey, Dominic. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first fight between two UFC commentators because he's part of the broadcast team in Spanish. Does that do anything for the bragging rights coming out of this one for you? Um, I didn't know I could brag about being a commentator. I mean, first one to win the first commentator versus commentator fight in UFC history. Man, two guys in suits. Um, <laughs> all right, let's go. Sounds like Anchorman. Uh, I feel like I know the answer to this one. Have you ever heard about him commentating one of your fights? I don't know. Has he? I, I don't know. Don't I, I don't keep him. track, man. I let people say what they're going to say. I can't control that. I don't, I don't make the rules. I just show up and fight. Do you know if DC has finally been watching more film? Doubt it. <laughs> Doubtful. But, again, I've learned to let go of control. 
DC is going to do DC. He's good at he's, – I call him the golden fluffer. He's like, whatever you want to hear, he will say it, and he will make you love him. So that's his gift, gift of gab. Being back in your town, what is your go-to uh, way of telling your friends that you don't have free tickets to give them? <laughs> I actually had to tell somebody that uh, I'm getting so many text messages that I get to turn my phone off at a certain point because, you know, uh, you just you got to try to be loving about it. We belong to the people, but it's like it's fascinating to me, especially this day and age with the Internet. The Internet has the answers to everything. And you're going to ask me, like, just go on the Internet, look up UFC, whatever the event is. Um, it's not hard to find tickets. But, no, I don't have free tickets to give. The UFC doesn't just go, hey, Dominic, since you're main eventing, we're going to go ahead and give you whatever seats you want for people. Like, it doesn't work that way. they got to make money. It's still a business. So, lovingly, I appreciate that you're reaching out. I appreciate the support. Um, it's it's kind of crazy, but in the end, I am just fighting a human being to the death. So I I can honestly say like support me. I gotta get through. Support me. Thank you. I gotta get through this. Thanks. Dominic, right here. Sorry, right over here. Um, when you first sat down and your first answer, you just mentioned and you alluded to your health. Um, how do you feel right now uh, heading into this fight? And how maybe do you have you evolved your your training methods to ensure that you are in in peak shape? Yeah, it's been a tricky <clears throat> a tricky thing because I always have sparred a lot, and you just have to take you know I still have to keep doing that that sparring. I still have to keep doing it because that's how I prepare. So to keep that level of work ethic and. Uh, amount of rounds I just had to add a lot more physical therapy and the UFC has been amazing um, with the health insurance that they offered us they'll take care of us if you talk to them and then you've got the UFC PI I live in Vegas obviously so I can go there and use that anytime I want but I do my camps here so I can get PT UFC helps me help support me on some of that and PT is to keep you from getting hurt before you get hurt if, you sh if you're doing that two three four times a week it really keeps the muscles loose. It keeps the body loose, and that really has helped. But I can honestly say that I made the 20s really hard on myself with decision-making, with mind, with thought process, with the stress. You know, I've heard a lot from interviews that I, I seem uh, more calm. I think that's just because of the maturity of just living life and having wins and losses and learning how to, you know, be more grateful for things instead of attaching to things. And that's really helped me, I think keep from getting hurt too is the mindset your mindsets you can manifest a lot of injuries just by being stressed it doesn't even have to have it doesn't even necessarily have to be the training itself it can be your thought process going into training and i i think that for sure i wasn't dealing with stress the best a lot uh if there was a right and wrong way to put it in my 20s and i'm doing the best i can now to to kind of keep things as calm as possible until i need to hype things up do you uh do you feel like you're still in your prime or maybe entering a, you know, a, a rebirth of your prime? The only reason why I ask that is because um, you're obviously entering an age, a stage of your career, you're going to be 37 soon, um, where some people might wonder, you know, if this is coming towards the end. But at the same time, we all know you missed a lot of fights. You left a lot of fights on the table, given your injury history. So do you feel like you're still in your prime? Because we've heard you talk about wanting to fight the guys above Cheeto after this, which means you must clearly think you're still gunning for a championship. I do think I'm still, I mean, why would I do this if I wasn't gunning for a championship? It'd be pretty useless, in my opinion. I mean, I'm not just, I'm doing this for the possibilities. We don't know what's going to happen, but I'm in it and I choose it. The ironic part that I always think is funny is how people say that I left a lot of fights on the table when, when I'm trying to come back. The only conversation was ring rust and he's had so much time off, how can he win? So how can you have both? Which is it? Is it hard to come back and win after being out for a long time? Or did you have time off and leave fights on the table? Is the question I would not just leave to media, but to, to everybody out there thinking about this. Like, which is it? Is it? I came back after layoffs and fought the best on the planet that had been continually active. 
and people are supposed to say that that's what you're supposed to do if there was a right and wrong. And I come back and beat those guys, guys on a five fight win streak with five finishes. I've been off three years, I come in and smash them and now it's, oh well, he's fresh because he left fights on the table. So it's like, it's all framework. Anything can be framed however it wants to be framed to, to work for you. Uh, and how it works for me is I'm going to come back and win. Ring rust doesn't exist. And that worked for me because as long as I put in the, wor the, the live rounds and take the beatings in practice, the ass whoopings that I take in practice don't feel a lot different than the ass whoopings I take on a fight night. They both hurt. <laughs> they both suck. So just prepare that way. And I do think I'm on my way towards the title. Why wouldn't I be, you know? Um, I'm in the top eight on my third title run facing a guy that's about eight years younger than me. It's really pissed off about something. I haven't figured out what yet, but uh, it should be interesting. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, Dom. Um, what's up? What's up, man? So you've had a lot of great trash talking moments in your career, but I think one of my favorite Dominic Cruz quotes of all time is, the greatest moment in my life was realizing I didn't need a belt to be happy. So when you wake up nowadays and that alarm goes off in the morning, I'm just wondering what makes Dominic Cruz happy. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, especially your hat says happy day. Happy dad, happy dad. Can't read apparently, that's why I <laughs> fight. Um, well, happy. What makes you happy is, you know, uh, a man cannot be at ease until he is at ease with himself. That's Shakespeare quote. So once you get at ease with yourself, it takes a lot of time. And the way that I've gotten to choose that is and, fi and find the way of being is being trapped in my own body for six months, three years at a time. And what I mean by trapped in my own body is um, when you blow your knees out and you get your career taken from you when you're at the highest level, and you're forced to, you know, you, a lot of my identity uh, was as an athlete during that early years. And when that got taken from me, I didn't know who I was. And I was forced into figuring that out and forced into living my life without the sport. And it was really hard, uh, very hard. One of the hardest things I've ever been through. But I, I wouldn't say I figured it out, but I found a way to deal with it. And... I think that's what supports me, you know. Um, being in service, as, as crazy as it sounds, when, when you're in your dumps, being in service to others really can pull you out of it. Coaching other people, helping them get to their goals. Um, you know, commentating did a lot for me. Being able to be in that seat and give back to the sport instead of looking at it as the sport's not giving me my shot. What can I give to the sport? I shifted my mindset, you know, move into another, just got to reframe it. So things like that. When fighting's over, I know what, it's, what it feels like to be retired already. I've had so many years, as they've alluded to, you know, what, six years, a lot of fights left on the table. I've had that feeling, media telling me I'm not as good as the people that I'm commentating. I've had everything you could think of be thrown at me while I'm sitting on the sidelines. So now that I've gotten to feel that, it ended up turning into a gift. It ended up becoming something that now I'm sitting here still going, even though everybody didn't necessarily think I could. Uh, and how how grateful can I be sitting here, considering, first of all, I'm not supposed to still be here, according to everybody else, because all the injuries. I should have never won the second title I won. Probably to everybody else, I'm the underdog in every fight that's going to come up from here. It's okay. I'm happy if it all ends. I choose this um, because the you know generally as humans we look for the safety like to know what the outcome is going to be um, to be in the fertile ground of endless possibility creativity and freedom to choose the unknown step into it in a vulnerable place and embrace the unknown rather than be scared of the unknown is why i'm here i choose it and so here i am thank you